welcome to this webinar, which is brought to you by ESTES, the European Society for Trauma and Emergency Surgery. The first recorded appendectomy was performed in 1735, and you might expect that after almost 300 years, there'd be nothing more to add to the topic. But last year alone, there were over 1,000 publications uh, on appendicitis. This common surgical condition with which all of us will be familiar remains controversial. In this webinar, some of those controversies will be addressed by Nicole Stassen from the University of Rochester in the United States, Jane Mazzani from Orebro University Hospital in Sweden, Jordan Estroff from George Washington University in the States, and Matti Tolonen from Helsinki University Hospital in Finland. Gary Bass, originally from Ireland, but currently at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, will also remind us of how we actually manage appendicitis with data, with data on over 4,500 studies at patients from the recently completed Estes cohort study. To feed the controversy further, there'll be several polls throughout the webinar, and we want you to take part in them. All polling is anonymous. We'd also encourage you to use the question and answer button to ask questions of our panelists as we go along. I'm going to hand over now to Shaheen Mazani to break us in gently with a case presentation on appendicitis. Shaheen. Thank you, Dr. Gilstead. So I'm going to just share my screen here. There we go. So these are real cases from real life. And let's see if we can agree on how we would proceed with the treatment, diagnostic, and so on and so forth. The first case is a 25-year-old female. She's healthy, no prior abdominal surgery and no medication, with a BMI of 18. So she was quite slim. Sorry, just jumps. She presents to us with two days of anorexia, no vomiting, no normal bowel movements, slight fever, and a migratory pain to right lower quadrant with local peritonitis and rebound tenderness. So looking at her labs, she had an increased white blood count, increased CRP, C-reactive protein, which is very common to uh, be taken here in Europe, in Sweden as well. So you see she's markedly elevated in her infection uh, labs. She had a normal urine analysis and the rest of her labs including LFTs were normal. So the first question can go to Dr. Tolonen. What would you score her for the risk of having an appendicitis? What score would you use? Uh, in my hospital, we would use the adult appendicitis score. So is she a high risk, low risk, intermediate risk? Okay. I would think, I think she goes into high risk group, but I haven't checked it. She goes into high risk group, yeah. With Alvarado, she's gonna at least score around eight. So the first question for this case, uh, which uh, the audience can also join us to answer, is what would be your next step? It's 5.30 a.m. in the morning. Would you send her for an ultrasound, a young, slim girl? Would you do a CT? Take her directly to an OR for laparoscopy, OR doing an open appendectomy, or send her for a gyne consult. We're just going to give a couple of minutes, or at least one minute, for the audience to respond. And there we have the results. So majority would go for an ultrasound and one third would go for a laparoscopic approach directly. Dr. Stassen, in United States, how would you proceed with this patient? I think um, given her age and the time, she'd probably end up getting a CAT scan in our emergency department. Um, she's mid-cycle, raising all sorts of gynecological questions. Um, more likely than not, she would have ended up with a CAT scan 
Certainly ultrasound in our adult population is becoming closer to first line, but CAT scan still tends to be um, the first step for most of our patients that come through the emergency room with this clinical presentation. Well, when, when we look here in Europe, when we look at the American data, most of the times when we discuss it, the issue with medical legal uh, issues come up. Is it is your approach because of that, or is it because you think that CT is much more sensitive and specific? I think certainly it's more specific as far as sensitivity. I think that could be debated in the literature. Um, as far as you know, somebody with a BMI of 18, most of our patient population does not have a BMI of 18. Um, they have a little more body armor than um, this particular young woman has. I think what would, um, I wouldn't say that we practice that my group's practices really affected by the medical legal component of it, but we likely wouldn't have even been called about her by our emergency department until after imaging was already done. And in that situation, the majority of the time it's gonna end up being CT scan as the primary in the adult population. Certainly pediatrics is a very different, um, a very different patient set, but in her age range, that time of the morning, realistically, she would have had a CAT scan before we ever saw her. Matthew, how are we dealing with this patient in Northern Europe? Would we do the radiology or OR directly? Well, it, 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 she scores very highly on the, on the scoring system. Uh, I think she would go straight to the OR for laparoscopy, no need for imaging. Dr. Bass, so now we have data from both United States and Europe and several centers. What are we actually doing today in real practice? This is, this is really interesting. I'm sure Dr. Stassen would agree with me that the practice in Rochester is similar to, to what we see in Penn is that a lot of the patients are referred from the emergency department after the CT. So as surgeons, we don't necessarily have as much of a role in determining who gets imaged. But what's very interesting looking at the results of the poll here today is that in comparison, when we look at four and a half thousand patients at the SD's uh, snapshot uh, audit, 11% uh, of patients were brought to the operating room on clinical diagnosis alone, 31% uh, um, after ul ultrasound diagnosis, uh, which is quite different to what we're seeing here. It's only half that seen in the opinion of, uh, of those polled today, and 57% um, of patients uh, following a CT scan. Again, radically different to the 9% we're seeing here, which is very interesting in and of itself. Yeah, and I don't know whether some of that is a bias related to the presentation of a young, skinny female patient, uh, or whether that represents practice overall. Gary, now you have said how it was in Penn. When you were back in Ireland, would you do a radiology on this one, or would you take her to the war? I think on balance, I probably would get an ultrasound to exclude uh, gynecologic causes, given the specific history of this patient. But I wouldn't necessarily hold out for a CT scan in this population. It's different in older patients, patients I'm concerned about malignancy or inflammatory bowel disease. But in this patient, I think an ultrasound, if it's possible, um, and if it's not possible, then we'd go for, go, go for diagnostic laparoscopy. So this, this, this was a case that I took over in the morning and uh, the surgeon on call, they had decided to uh, go for direct laparoscopic approach. And in this particular case, let's see, it was actually a severely inflamed uh, appendicitis. So moving on to the second case, and uh, this is a 26 year old male, also health in no medication, no prior surgeries, with a BMI of 21. He comes in with one day of anorexia, no vomiting. He didn't have a fever, but he had right abdominal pain. Uh, and when talking to him, he didn't know if it's by migratory or not. 
on physical exam, he had the right lower quadrant tenderness, no peritonitis, and a negative rebounder rosewing sign. He had an elevated white blood count, mildly elevated CRP, C-reactive protein, and all the other labs were normal. So in this case, he's a low or a median risk for appendicitis. On the other hand, he's a male with right lower quadrant pain. And the question is, how would we go further with this patient? Dr. Estrop, is this a patient for radiology, home, OR? Let's see if Jordan is with us. Yes, I am. You know, I think uh, I had the same limitations that uh, Dr. Stassen does, where um, all these patients are going to end up with a CT scan before the surgeon is involved. Um, and I think some of that has to do with resource utilization. Um, you know, in addition to the uh, higher BMI, um, you know, for, for many of our centers or some of our centers, a CT in the middle of the night is actually more accessible than an ultrasound in the middle of the night. Um, and so, while traditionally, if I was called prior to a scan, I would probably not scan this patient. However, um, this patient is going to come to us with a with the CT in hand yeah. from the ED. Okay, and Dr. Tilsett, could we do the poll here and see how our audience would handle this? And then that's also a big difference between the United States because you have your emergency physician that actually have the diagnosis before they call you. Uh, in Sweden and some other Northern European countries, we are consulted just for the abdominal pain. So for this patient, almost half would go for ultrasound, 38% would go for CT, and just one in 10 would go for laparoscopy. And this is a male patient with lower abdominal pain. Uh, Dr. Bass, what, what would our data tell us? Is it a difference when it comes to males, females, young or older? In terms of the operative approach, uh, at these early days, it's hard to tell. It's, uh, our, our study had 45% uh, of patients were female um, without comorbidities. Given that they were, with the limit that they were just, they were all adults, had a median age of 36, perhaps older than people might have expected. Um, and given that demographic, it's likely that we're, we're more likely to lean on some imaging before pulling the trigger on, a, on the OR. Again, as Dr. Estrup says, in terms of resource utilization, but a lot of other reasons as well, such as equipoise in your, in your diagnosis. Okay. So uh, this patient was actually also um, taken directly to the OR. And what we found was macroscopically no inflamed appendix. And we ran through the bowel and looked at the gallbladder and uh, all the other organs, and we couldn't find any source of abdominal pain in this patient. Dr. Stassen, how would you proceed in this case? Would you, would you leave the appendix or continue with the appendectomy? So um, two things. I think this is one person that we might not have imaged because he's a male. And if we're taking someone to the operating room with the concern for appendicitis, they're going to leave the operating room without an appendix for two reasons. One, I think sometimes you can have um, inflammation of the appendix that isn't necessarily as macroscopically visible. It may be very early. Two, 10 years from now, this 20 something year old male is gonna have three small scars on his abdomen. There's going to be question, oh, I think I had appendicitis. Um, they will never have appendicitis again after leaving the operating room. Okay. So let's see how our audience would handle this. If they would leave a microscopic 
normal appendix or continuity appendectomy. So 89% overwhelming majority would go on with the appendectomy in this case, which is also uh, backed up with the War Society of Emergency Surgery guidelines. Dr. Bass, in real life practice, do we have any data on if they left the appendix or? Yeah, it, it, so interestingly in our, in our four and a half thousand patients, uh, only 198 patients, so about 4%, they left the patient, the appendix behind um, without, as in they didn't resect it. Um, so presuming that that's a, that's a negative laparoscopy, um, it's hard to know from the data from a 10,000 foot view whether or not uh, they left it behind because they saw some other pathology like uh, ovarian pathology. Uh, but interestingly, about 3.5% of the appendix um, specimens submitted for histopathology uh, did not were normal appendix and didn't show appendicitis. I found that interesting because, uh, and I'd love to hear from the other panelists their perception of what a negative appendectomy rate might be in this modern era and how that correlates with our preoperative imaging. Dr. Estrup, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, I think with the. Um... The, the practice in the US of imaging just about every single patient. I, I think the negative appendectomy rate should be much less than the traditional 10%, um, probably more on the order of 1%, 2% or less, given the sensitivity and specificity, especially with our use of CT scans. Um, I think you can make arguments depending specifically on what your um, imaging modality is and whether or not you do imaging as well. Dr. Tolonen, so now we have two cases where we discuss the preoperative management or risk certification of this patient. Uh, and here in Northern Europe, we are more restrictive with our radiology. Do you know the numbers of negative appendectomies at your center or in Northern Europe? Um, from the snap -up results, our negative appendectomy rate in our hospital and, uh, and the other big hospital next to us, which is under the same, under the same uh, guidance, is, is, was 1.9%. 1.9%. 1.9%. Okay. Yes, and, and we do not image all of them. That's good numbers. So, and now you're going to do your appendectomy. How would you handle the stump in this case? Would you do them endo loop, liga loop, or staple? Maddie? Endo loop. You would do endo loop? Yeah. Okay. Are we still doing those? <laughs> that, that... <laughs> uh, Dr. Estroff, how would you handle the stump in this case? No inflammation, no, uh, no perforation. Um, <clears throat> I'm a little embarrassed to admit I'm a stapler. Okay. Dr. Sasson? No need to be embarrassed. We too use staplers up north. Um, but I think there's certainly a move back towards endo loops on, uh, from a cost perspective on a patient like this where the stump is uninflamed, etc. cetera. Um, I think about 50% of our group would staple this and about 50% would endo loop it out of the eight of us. But I would staple it. Awesome. So we, we do basically uh, uh, stapling every single time. So before I go to the third case, uh, I'm going to let Dr. Tolonen give us an update on where we are standing with the risk certification and radiology. Matthew, if you could share your screen.
and you need to unmute your mic, Matty. It's easy to talk with the mic on. Yep, that's true. And you see the screen, Ollie. Shane, can you confirm or Jonathan, please, that do you see the yes. shared screen? We, we can see you and we can hear you now. All right, that's great. So thank you very much. Uh, my name is Matti Tolman. I'm an emergency surgeon from Helsinki University Hospital. I'm going to give you a short presentation of this uh, imaging and risk stratification while suspecting acute appendicitis. And um, the uh, the primary goals uh, in this in this issue are to diagnose correctly. Uh, preferably all the patients with acute appendicitis. And another thing is to avoid the uh, unnecessary surgeries and the negative appendectomy rate, rate should be at least less than 5%, preferably closer to 2%. And the secondary goals here are to avoid unnecessary ionizing radiation, especially in younger patients. And also, especially, uh, if, con if considering conservative management, uh, the CT has a role in, in differentiation between uncomplicated and complicated disease. And also in real life, it's important to diagnose other abdominal pathologies or to be able to discharge your patient straight from the, from the ED with, with uh, non-surgical or, or, or non-specific abdominal pain. And currently, there's no internationally accepted consensus on the on the matter. The old school style, not so long ago, was that all the surgeons made their individual preference based on solely clinical assessment without using any imaging or or a validated scoring system to stratificate the risk. This this uh, approach ends up in in about twenty percent of all the all the acute appendicitis cases missed, and uh, around 20% negative appendectomy rate. And it is no longer acceptable. Uh, the modern approach in diagnosing acute appendicitis, there are basically two options. One is to use the scoring systems to stratificate your patients and image some of them. And the other option is to image uh, pretty much everybody. And with the imaging strategies, you can use ultrasound, CT, or MRI. In our practice, MRIs are, are used in pregnant patients or some selected very young patients. And a very nice strategy, in my opinion, is to do first an ultrasound. And if it is inconclusive, then you can continue with the low-dose CT scan. Here are... Uh, examples of the three most used scoring systems, the Alvarado system, uh, AIR system, and AAS system. And as you can see, uh, these scoring systems have some pretty simple things about, about uh, the clinical presentation of the patient, as well as some basic laboratory exams. The Alvarado score uh, is less, less often used nowadays because it hasn't been it has shown uh, not to be as good as the other two mentioned scoring systems are. This is an example of the adult appendicitis, appendicitis score system, which is currently used in our hospital. So when you have a patient of, of suspected acute appendicitis, and I would like to point out that this is not right lower abdominal pain. This is that you actually suspect an acute appendicitis, then you can use the scoring system, otherwise no. If you get a low score, which is about a third of the patients, you get discharged with information. If you get a medium score, uh, which is most patients, you proceed with diagnostic imaging. In younger patients, you do ultrasound first, and if it's inconclusive, continue with a low-dose CT scan. And uh, in, in patients older than 35 years old, you proceed straight to CT scan. Uh, and if you have a high score, then you go straight to laparoscopy. With this system, about 50% of the patients who 
uh, actually have acute appendicitis gets uh, cross-sectional imaging. And just a friendly reminder to all of you that CT alone cannot differentiate between complicated and uncomplicated acute appendicitis. 22% uh, of the imaging gets it, gets it wrong uh, when compared to the moment of the surgery. If you would combine uh, just the CT with some specific, specific things on the CT scan and also in the patient presentation, you might end up with a better result. To conclude, uh, clinical ass assessment only and, and surgeon makes the decision on, on how to proceed based on, on the time of the day, et cetera, is no longer a valid strategy. The most common, commonly preferred option, which is also uh, preferred in the WSDS guidelines, is to use, use risk, risk stratification scores and sel use selective imaging. Some authors prefer imaging for all, and here you must, must remember that when pretest probability is very low, you get quite a large number of false, false positive radiology. And on the other end of the spectra, with very high pretest probability, you might get false negative results uh, and you might have to do surgery even if it's not clear that there is acid uh, appendicitis in the CT scan. The US first uh, with conditional CT is, uh, is a good strategy. And I think we all need to find ways that work well are in our local circumstances. And uh, you cannot prove an, an appendicitis being uncomplicated just based on the safety scan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matty. So let's move on with the case number three then. 45 year old male presented during the highest peak of COVID-19 pandemic to an ISA hospital. This is when, where we had problem with our ICUs and the awards. So it was really bad here in Sweden as well as some other countries. The patient was healthy since before, no medications and no peri-abdominal surgery with a BMI of 22. He had the symptoms, uh, of an appendicitis with the clinical physical exam, mildly elevated white blood count and CRP. And he had a CT verified non-complicated appendicitis, which was seven millimeter in diameter, hyperemic, no appendicolite, or no signs of perforation. Based on the guidelines out then, and it uh, was uh, first proposed by the Royal College of Surgeons some people implemented the non-operative management with antibiotics. So the question is how many of you, our audience would suggest a non-operative management for this patient? We're just gonna give everybody a minute. So at least 65%, uh, two thirds would, in this case, go with a non-operative, only antibiotic approach. Dr. Estroff, did you implement the non-operative management in your hospital? Um, we are still using non-operative management selectively. Um, basically, uh, as a result of the CODA trial, we had the conversations with the patients regarding um, the 30-day quality of life, but also discussed the fact that there's still a roughly 24 to 30% operative uh, um, op or uh, patients undergo operation um, when they're when they're treated uh, with the antibiotics alone. And, and really, we've shifted much more to a robust conversation with the patients and give them the option of deciding um, whether to proceed with um, non-operative management or primary appendectomy. Thank you. 
Dr. Bass, do we have the numbers of how many patients did get the non-operative approach during the three months of the SS snapshot API? Interestingly, very few. So four and a half thousand patients, uh, just under 4,000 of them, about 86% had their appendix out on their index visit. Um, so the remaining 15%, uh that's 630 odd patients about 400 of them six the two thirds of two thirds of that group had an interval api um and then just one third or less than five percent of the total group had a successful non-operative management during the three month um capture window for follow-up thank you back to you, dr estroff if the patients says, okay, I'm going to go with the non-operative management. What antibiotic and for how long and in what route would you give it? That's a great question. I, I think for us, I'm going to look at our antibiogram. Um, you know, typically I'm going to go with something as an out, if I'm outpatient management of non-operative appendicitis, um, augmentin. Um, we have a very high resistance to the fluoroquinolones here. Um, in the Washington DC area. Um, and then for the inpatient, um, do if they need inpatient admission, then we're probably gonna go with something um, like a third generation cephalosporin with metronidazole, um, also based on our antibiogram. So um, I would encourage anyone to look at their local antibiogram uh, and making those decisions uh, rather than relying on um, you know, what we're able to do in our area. Okay, and, and, and for how long are you, is it the white blood count or is it the physical exam that you follow uh, or you have a set uh, like three days intravenous? Sure, so um, again, it kind of depends on the patient. The, typically my total course is gonna be roughly seven days uh, or it's gonna be seven days. And then the IV portion is gonna depend on their ability to tolerate PO um, and a, uh, white or leukocytosis that is downtrending. It does not have to normalize first. Okay. Dr. Stassen, you are on the other side of the U.S., or at least in the middle of the U.S. Would you recommend based on the American randomized trials? Well, so are you asking about choice of antibiotics or to give antibiotics? Uh, no, I'm, I'm asking you, uh, when, when you are talking to your patients, based on the data that came from United States, uh, are you, because we can give the patient the information with the panel being, you know what, go with the surgery or you know what, go with the antibody. So how would you present the data from the randomized trials that come out now, that 30% failed within three months or 70% got better? and didn't have the surgery in three months. So um, as we were talking before as a, as a panel, um, you know, I, I definitely lean more towards surgical intervention. I think one thing that is very important when you're having discussions is to try to check your biases at the door, which is very difficult. Certainly um, I would focus more on the 30% failure rate because that's going to impact how this individual, you know, what's going on in their life, what else is going on with them. You know, the case you presented is somebody with, you know, in quotations, uncomplicated appendicitis. But as Dr. Tulinan just presented, you know, CAT scan's not perfect for that. So there's going to be multiple factors that come into play with that. But my stress is going to be on that 30% that will fail so that they are well educated as to what they need to look for if they choose that option and that we're making sure we have the appropriate follow-up for that individual and that they don't look at it and go, well, I'm going to be just fine. So I don't need to be concerned about, about these, these issues. Thank you. With that, Dr. Sesson, uh, if you would like to give your presentation on the data and where we are standing today. And you, your mic is not on. Dr. Stassen, uh, your mic is not. Yep, I got it. I just, with my shared screen, I had to, um, I had to make sure that I was in the right location to press my unmute button. But is it really a Zoom meeting if someone hasn't spoken muted? I think not. 
Um, so um, again, thank you, um, Dr. Mergini, for inviting me to be a, a part of this panel. Um, appendicitis, it seems so simple. It's an organ the size of your pinky. Why does it, why does it cause so much drama? Um, so when we look at the evidence for non-operative management um, with antibiotics, first I have nothing to disclose, but as you just heard, I have a slight bias towards surgical intervention. Um, when you look at um, antibiotic management for uncomplicated appendicitis, um, this is just a, one study along the way, but there were multiple trials really looking at whether antibiotics first was non-inferior to appendectomy. So I think that's important to stress because it doesn't mean it's better, it just means it's non-inferior. So one of, the, one of the trials was the APAC trial back, done back in 2015, um, and there were multiple, multiple, multiple trials along the way. And this is, again, just a representative. Um, the Eastern Association for the Surgery of Trauma back in 2019 tried to put some of this together, as did um, the, you know, multiple other organizations um, have done this as well. But looking with grade, looking at the current literature really to define our practice management for acute appendicitis. What GRADE is based on is asking what are called PICO questions. Um, so the two questions that were, that were tried to be answered um, in this particular trial were in adult patients with uncomplicated appendix, appendicitis, would antibiotic first versus appendectomy increase or decrease the rates of perforation or abscess? And it's, you can see the rest of the question. And the second question was in these patients with a, uncomplicated appendicitis that were managed non-operatively, should we be doing random or should we be doing um, delayed interval appendectomies in the person that was asymptomatic? And what they found was interesting looking at, and it included um, multiple different trials um, done from about 2008 up to the 2015 study. And again, this came out before the CODA trial, which we'll talk about in a minute. But what they really found was that for most of these trials, looking at um, the data together, whether you looked at delayed risk of perforation or abscess or wound infection, hospital length of stay, um, only cost effectiveness um, and hospital length of stay did really see a favoring of appendix appendectomy with hospital length of stay. And for cost effectiveness, of course, antibiotics, where antibiotics are significantly less expensive than operative intervention, when you looked at the things that we sort of consider also important, perforation, abscess, or wound infection, there really wasn't perfect data when you combined all of this to go in either direction. So what they concluded was that they were unable to make a recommendation um, for or against antibiotics first as the primary treatment, again, for uncomplicated appendicitis. And then they conditionally recommended against um, the interval appendectomy in an asymptomatic patient. But what they also pointed out was that there were lots of limitations in the public in the published literature at the time, with lots of research that could still um, that should still be done on the topic. A year later, the CODA first the CODA trial came out. Again, this is a non-blinded non-blinded again non-inferiority study that was randomized randomized patients to either appendectomy or primary treatment with antibiotic therapy with a 10-day course of antibiotics. And that could be a mixture of IV and PO or just PO antibiotics. This is the largest trial to date when you looked at most of the trials um, in, the East, in the East practice management guideline. Most were under 500 patients. Um, when you look at something like appendicitis, certainly um, probably a little underpowered for what they were trying to show. The other difference with the CODA trial is most trials in the past had eliminated individuals with an appendicula where the CODA trial include that, included them. And again, what was found was that antibiotic treatment was not inferior to surgery, meaning not necessarily better, but patients didn't do worse with antibiotics first. The initial results really just looked at the general health status of these individuals at 30 days and then with safety events. And if you look at um, this chart here, sort of summarizing whether antibiotics um, whether it favored antibiotic management first or appendectomy first, we looked at the, um, the good health um, uh, questionnaire, really they were equivalent with antibiotics versus surgery. The same with the initial time in the emergency department or in the hospital. So first visit, time spent in the emergency room and in the hospital was the same in both groups. 
after a month, um, symptoms, pain, fever, et cetera, were about the same in both groups. Of course, no surgery. Well, of course, if you had an appendectomy, you had an operation. So that does favor antibiotics, which seems like a question that isn't really useful in asking. Um, as far as in hospital pa inpatient stay, about half of the individuals didn't have to be admitted to the hospital for their antibiotic treatment, where most patients, um, about 95% were admitted at least for the night after, for one night after surgery. As far as work missed, um, on average, um, patients with antibiotics missed less work, only about five days versus close to nine days with surgical intervention. But when it came to sort of after, after um, appendicitis issues, um, about 9% of the antibiotics only group did have to go back to the emergency department within the first three months, where only 4% was that necessary in the surgical group. And then of course, if your appendix is gone, you can't really have recurrent appendicitis. Um, so certainly there was no recurrent appendicitis in the, in the surgical group, um, but with, and the treatments were really completed within one hospital visit in the surgical group where about 29% of the group ended up um, needing surgery within um, three months in the antibiotic group. And as we just talked about, do you say 30% needed it or 70% didn't? 30% um, did require um, operation in three months and about 40% that had an appendicolith. So a little higher risk in those with, with um, individuals that had, uh, had an appendicolith as far as needing surgery within that first three months. Within the last month, um, the longer term follow-up has come out from the CODA trial, looking again at the comparison of antibiotics and appendectomy, um, and looking at one year, about 40% of the population um, ends up needing um, a subsequent appendectomy in the antibiotics group. At two years, that gets closer to 50%, and at three to four years, again, it's just under 50% ended up needing an appendectomy. Now, depending on sort of what side of the fence you, you lay on, lie on, you really could take this data and say, you must operate or antibiotics are okay. I think what this shows us is that it's not inappropriate to have a discussion with your patient with uncomplicated appendicitis, that treating them initially with antibiotics, depending on what's going on in their life, et cetera, is an absolutely safe choice. When you look at um, the summary from Dr. Flum um, of the who's the co-principal investigator of the CODA trial. So in the first three months, nearly seven out of 10 patients avoided having surgery. And at four years, only 50% um, required an operation. And other outcomes also favored antibiotics. But together, you, again, antibiotics may be the right treatment for, some, for a chunk of patients, but probably not all. Um, the New England Journal just of Medicine um, in September um, had actually a, a case discussion about acute uncomplicated appendicitis. And this is an individual that was pretty similar to that second case that Dr. Machini presented um, earlier. If you look at indications for non-operative treatment of appendicitis, appropriate candidates should have localized appendicitis without peritonite, diffuse peritonitis or a large abscess legmon concern for tumor perforation. They should be hemodynamically normal without evidence of sepsis or septic shock. And that's where some of the grading scales that you heard from Dr. Tillinen certainly come into play. They can't be pregnant or be immune compromised or have a history of inflammatory bowel disease. Again, this is a different patient population and you really wanna think twice before suggesting just antibiotics. Again, if they have an appendicolith, that should also be considered. Um, although in the, the um, most recent um, follow-up on the CODA trial, the appendicolith over long-term didn't really make a difference in needing an appendectomy. Um, and if a person is a bit older, um, you may want to consider um, leaning away from non-operative therapy. When you look at guidelines um, from professional societies, the AAST, um, certainly surgery or non-operative approach is reasonable. That was from 2018, so that was pre-Dakota trials. We look at the NIH here in the US. Again, surgical treatment is the accepted standard, but medical treatment, including antibiotics, is a viable alternative. Um, the World Journal of Emergency or World Society of Emergency Surgery, just in 2020, again, there's high evidence to support non-operative treatment with antibiotics. It can be a safe alternative, but it has to be discussed with that patient. 
and then with the American College of Surgeons in 2020, and that this feeds into a bit the case that was discussed about during um, the height of COVID-19. Certainly, um, this is from the statement on on emergency general surgery in the in patients with COVID. You certainly can look at at, um, at antibiotic therapy first and not put them at the risk of surgical intervention. There's a decision tool, the Appy or Not decision tool from the CODA study group. It includes a video for the patient to watch and then patient questions following the video. This is actually the link to that video. And then it has some percentage outcomes based on patient input. So um, most of it is based on the first question is stratifying whether they had an appendicular or not. And these are actually, if the patient wasn't sure, looking at um, antibiotic only versus surgical intervention. So in two weeks, are your symptoms going to get better? The risk stratification of that, the chance that you'll need to be admitted again if you're undergoing surgical intervention or antibiotics. If you'll need to have a drain placed in the future, if the antibiotics wouldn't work, what's the, the risk that you may need an appendectomy in the next three months? Then goes through a series of questions of what is and isn't important to you. Um, is it extremely important that you never get readmitted? Is it extremely important that you feel better as soon as possible? And then gives a summary table of what your options are and then something to actually bring to your provider of, hey, I've gone through this series and my treatment choice, mm, I'm gonna be looking more towards surgery or, or antibiotics. So this gives you a tool to work with your patients where you're going through all the pluses and minuses. So the conclusion is that antibiotics absolutely can be considered as a first line treatment in uncomplicated appendicitis, but it is absolutely patient dependent. And it has to be done with shared decision making with that patient. So can we reach agreement? Absolutely. You can use antibiotics, but you need to use them in the right patient at the right time. Thank you very much, Dr. Sasson. Excellent presentation and topic. So let's move on. So this patient was treated uh, with one day IV antibiotic, no abdominal pain, tolerated uh, PO and was discharged home with PO antibiotic for five days and there was no follow up. However, the same patient, I have it as case three, we could have it as case four. Uh, reemerged eight months later to our hospital with abdominal pain that started six days uh, prior to admission. He did not seek healthcare because he didn't want to burden the healthcare system during the COVID period. And he had been tested positive for COVID eight weeks prior to current admission. He had fever, high fever, anorexia for the last couple of days with vomiting on the day of admission with no bowel movements. He had right quadrant uh, peritonitis and positive rebound tendonets with significantly elevated white blood count and CRP. So he got the CT scan and, and uh, I'm not sure how our audience can see this. So I'm just gonna say that he had a uh, quite large abscess after perforated appendicitis. So in this case, what would the audience do? Would they go for an antibiotic only treatment in this patient? Go for a percutaneous drainage and antibiotics, laparoscopic or open surgery? So now we have an apapsis quite large. 55% would go with the percutaneous drainage and 30% would go with the laparoscopic approach. Dr. Bass, what would you do? This patient wasn't systemically uh, that unwell, if I recall correctly. Um, 
in the first instance, uh, percutaneous drainage and antibiotics seems reasonable. Um, they're also an unusual patient, only about, we all have nightmares about these patients and free peritonitis and having to do laparotomies for appendicitis. But in actuality, in the SNAP API, uh, fewer than 7% were uh, high AAST grade ref reflecting um, abscesses at diagnosis. Okay. Dr. Tolanen, your approach? Uh, we do routine surgery for all the patients with uh, abdominal abscess disease. Laparoscopic you start with a laparoscopic approach or you go directly to open surgery? Laparoscopic. Okay. So Matty and I, we are basically trained in the same era. So we went for the laparoscopic approach in this patient. And obviously we went into the abscess. And it did not get any easier. There you see the appendix, highly inflammated inflammated in uh, the abscesses. So here's a question for audience again. What would you do at this stage? Would you convert to open surgery, leave a drain and back out, or continue with the laparoscopic approach? So overwhelming majority would continue with the laparoscopic approach. Dr. Estra, how would you proceed? Yeah, for me at this point, it depends on, on what I can see. In that video, I felt I could see the base of the appendix uh, potentially. So I would probably continue with laparoscopic approach until I felt that I was potentially uh, unable to proceed. I think if uh, I get in and I see an abscess and an obliterated appendix, which I feel is more likely the case in, in my scenarios where I've had this happen, where I'm uh, in laparoscopically, um, then I would leave a drain in the abscess and try to get out and basically treat it as though we had done a percutaneous drainage. If you would go to the converting, would you do the McBurney's incision or would you go with the laparotomy or lower abdominal laparotomy? At this point, um, I can do more with laparoscopic than I can through McBurney's because um, you always have the access of a fourth and fifth port. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm going to, if I'm having to convert to open, it's going to be a midline incision. So in this case, this was actually one of my own cases. I kept on going and as you can see, it didn't get any prettier, but Uh, we could uh, identify the base eventually. So now you have the uh, appendix base. How would you handle the stump? And this is also a question for the audience. Would you do, use an endostapler, legal loop, endoclips, or uh, do the laparoscopic suturing. So once again, majority goes with the endo stapler. Dr. Stassen, uh, from the look of it, uh, obviously I don't have the whole movie here, but would you try to get some of the cecum in that uh, staple line or, uh, or not when it's that yes. inflamed? Um, when it's that inflamed, um, a small cup of healthy cecum, making sure you're not narrowing the, the junction with the terminal ileum, I think is vital um, in this patient population. So um, the point that Dr. Estoff brought up, I think um, 
if converting to open, I also would use a midline incision. I think, again, that right lower quadrant, if you can't get it done with a scope, you're less likely to be able to do something through a McBurney's point um, incision. So, but for sure, if I'm stapling this and I'm still laparoscopic, I'm going to take a cuff of healthy cecum. I think the other thing I worry about with the, this type of patient, when he was a little on the, the younger side, is, is there more than just appendicitis going on with him? Um, so that'll also hopefully give you a, a negative margin if there is something more sinister lurking than just simple appendicitis. Thank you. And uh, I can just make a comment on the laparotomy part. Uh, at least in Europe, and I'm sure the, the same thing is in the United States, that our residents and uh, as junior attendings, we are getting better and better with the laparoscopic surgery. So when it comes to going to convert, I think those are the worst, absolutely the worst cases. And the laparotomy approach is to be considered as the first line approach because then you have more uh, access. So moving on here to the next question for the audience, would you irrigate with large volume like running the patient from the inside or irrigate with small volume of saline or whatever you use in your practice or no irrigation at all, just suction and some minor uh, fluid to be used. Okay, there are the audience are not agreeing on this one. Dr. Tolonen, what's your practice and why? Uh, I would be reluctant to to use much of irrigation on on abscesses in general. I mean, if there's if there's peritonitis everywhere, then I would I would ir probably irrigate some. Uh, but with abscesses, I, I don't think it plays any role. You just uh, you put the pus all over the abdomen if you irrigate it a lot. Just just suck out. Uh, whatever leftovers there are. Once again, me and you have the same practices being from the Northern Europe. Dr. Stassen, what's your practice? You might it's, there you go. It's, it's exactly the same. And I'm, I'm overjoyed to hear that it's not just a, you know, Rochester thing, but I think if you have limited purulence to one area of the abdomen, I think it's very, especially large volume irrigation. If you irrigate large volumes, you're just spreading it everywhere and you can't get all of that rid of all of that fluid. You're just going to have it now up above the spleen and up above the liver where it wasn't there before. So if it's a limited abscess, suck out what's there and leave it alone. Don't spread it out all over the place. So, and I think that's very different than what we may have done back when I was training in the, in the nineties, when we were through McBurney's incisions and you irrigated the bejesus out of everybody and everybody ended up with abscesses. Thank you. So here's another question for the audience. Do you leave a drain, intra-abdominal drain, when you are done with this uh, appendectomy? Seventy-one percent would leave an intra-abdominal drain. Gary, what's your practice? I would not leave a drain. My practice is similar to yourself, Dr. Tolan, Dr. Stassen, and not irrigating. And I'm presuming the 70% of people who leave a drain are using that to suck out the, um, the pus that they put all around the abdomen with their irrigation. Okay. Dr. Estraf, are you of other opinion on this one? I'm, I'm in the do not leave a drain. If you have successfully aspirated, the, the purulence, then uh, there should be no need for an additional drain. Okay, and uh, before I'm gonna give the floor to Dr. Estrop for the last presentation here, let's say we went with the drain, percutaneous drainage. Dr. Stassen, what would you recommend? An interval appendectomy or not? 
If you'd asked me 10 years ago, I'd say yes to the interval appendectomy. I think if you ask me now, I would say no to the interval appendectomy with the caveat of it depends on the age group of the patient. I think if it's a young, healthy individual, there is not an indication for an interval appendectomy. I think if you have an older individual, 40s or older, there's a much higher risk that that is not just simple appendicitis. And in those, I would do an interval appendectomy. But in the younger patient, would you do the, the colon colonoscopy and uh... in somebody 20 or less no um you know the most common so that first peak of appendicitis no i would not in anyone older for sure they're getting a colonoscopy okay and i would leave a drain in that first case so <laughs> okay okay nice let's see where we are now oh sorry so with that i would like to thank you and give the floor to Dr. Estra for his presentation on this subject. There we go. Okay. So um, I would also add that uh, anyone who has family history of any of the cancers, I would also consider of the colon cancer, especially even if they're under 40, I would send them for a colonoscopy. Um, based on the routine screening guidelines for colon, for, uh, for colon cancer. Um, so kind of addressing when you have an appendiceal abscess, what are your, your next steps? And um, we're going to kind of talk about the overall data for operative irrigation and drainage, and then also briefly touch on uh, the role of interval appendectomy. And um, like Dr. Sasson, if you had asked me this even five years ago or two years ago, I probably would have said everybody gets an interval appendectomy and I think this has been one of the areas of some of the most rapid change on the operative management of appendicitis other than the antibiotics. Um, and so when you look at whether to, to drain or, or not drain, um, you know, there's kind of several studies. And I think looking back as early as 10 years ago, um, when you had, there's a single institution where they matched those who they drained and those that they did it and found that um, not leaving a drain actually had less overall complications and also importantly reduced the hospital length of stay. Um, while they didn't look at cost, uh, one can uh, potentially infer a cost savings as well um, to the healthcare system on that. Um, most of the randomized studies and meta-analyses that were out there looked at what happens when you um, kind of do an open um, operation. And uh, again, they found this in, in the meta-analysis of the randomized studies, they found there's no difference in recurrence. Um, so if they did a open drainage and left a drain behind, um, there was no difference in a, a new abscess formation. Um, and then there's talk about um, in the World Sur Society for Emergency Surgery Guidelines, um, in the 2016 version, they talk about using judicious caution. Um, but I think some of the more recent data, including um, a post hoc analysis from the Mustang trial, which is an American multicenter trial, which found um, multi, which was a, a over 100 uh, something patients, um, found some results to the first study that I mentioned. And with that data in mind, the World Society of European Surgery Guidelines uh, moved uh, to recommending not drainage. Um, what about laparoscopic appendectomy for abscess, uh, where uh, as opposed to antibiotics or um, percutaneous drainage? Um, again, this is an area where there's still a lot of debate ongoing. Um, when you look at kind of the meta-analyses that are out there um, from the, the mid 2000, 2010s up until 2010s, um, a lot of mixed uh, data. You have these studies that show uh, no improved benefit um, by operating on the abscesses over antibiotics versus drainage. Um, however, one study that is uh, uh, quoted in the, um, in the World Society of Emergency Surgery Guidelines is the Mentula randomized control trial. This was a, a single center, single surgeon operation um, in which they went in for all uh, laparoscopic appendectomy for abscesses over antibiotics versus percutaneous drainage. And they actually found that these patients had improved what they called an uneventful recovery um, in terms of lower complication, uh, complication rate. Um, and they also had a lower unplanned readmission rate. So this is still an area where much uh, is needed in terms of research um, and high quality 
large um, multi-center studies that can actually address the question, is laparoscopic appendectomy for abscess uh, superior or at least non-inferior or potentially superior to either percutaneous drainage or antibiotics alone. And then um, Dr. Stassen um, um, alluded to some of these uh, about the question of the interval appendectomy. Um, when you look at the EAST 2019 practice uh, management guidelines, they do recommend against um, routine interval appendectomy. At the time of their study, the CODA data uh, wasn't out yet. Um, uh, but what they had, which they were basing on was one randomized control trial and two retrospective studies. Um, in that randomized control trial, the median, median follow-up was uh, three years. Um, and really kind of as Dr. Stason pointed out to, um, that there are several limitations. It includes the fact that really the only risk of recurrence of acute appendicitis um, was the only clear outcome that was being measured across all the studies. Um, beyond that, there was mixed outcomes, which makes it hard to interpret all the data uh, at a level. They did point out the risk of recurrent um, acute appendicitis in those studies was 24%. Um, but, uh, you know, given that it was uh, conditionally recommended against. And then when you look at the World Society of European Surgery, they, they looked at similar studies as the East Practice Management Guidelines, um, as well as a uh, system, systematic review that came out um, after the East Practice Management Guidelines includes some cost evaluation um, that showed that a uh, routine interval appendectomy has similar um, outcomes, uh, but also has increased cost. And so the, the recommendation um, from uh, WSCS is against routine interval appendectomy, um, limiting it those to those who have interval uh, recurrent symptoms, um, and those who might be at high risk should undergo additional workup um, for possible malignancies. Thank you very much for an excellent presentation. So uh, with that said, I'm going to leave the mic to Dr. Tilsett. Dr. Tilsett. Thank you very much. Um, I think that we have had an excellent uh, webinar this evening looking at the controversies that surround appendicitis and the management thereof. I think what we've learned is that despite the 300 years of experience, we still have a lot that we don't know, a lot of things that we need to discover. And uh, I hope that there are enough people younger in their careers than myself who will take on the challenge of actually answering those questions. I think it's been a great uh, set of panelists we've had this evening. I'd like to thank Nicole Stassen, Shaheen Hosseini, Jordan Estroff, Matty Tollenham, and Gary Bass for their great contributions to this evening. Also, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank our webinar team of Diego Mariani, Alan Bellasanavo, Beata Corriara, and Mauro Zago. I hope you've enjoyed this webinar and that you'll join us again for pediatric skeletal trauma, where we'll be looking at common injuries of the elbow, forearm and wrist and possible complications. I hope you've enjoyed this evening. And uh, I think this is a good time for us to say uh, thank you very much to everybody.